Major funding for these programs is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Geneva Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, The Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of American Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, Colliers International New York City, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG Partners, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grubb Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJB Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and These Friends. So I have a young lady today who's really, she's like the queen of PR in New York City. She's the queen of real estate PR. This young lady from Connecticut who is the president, founder, and CEO of Great Inc. I'm lucky to have Roxanne Donovan. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Michael. So we'll get to the story about Lois Lane in a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your grandparents? Okay, you know, we had grandparents from Philadelphia, and then we had grandparents from Cleveland. So tell me about... Philadelphia first, since it's closer than Cleveland. Okay, uh, my dad's family is, was from Philadelphia, and he, my dad's grandparents were from the Ukraine and from Romania, and they ended up in Philadelphia, where my grandpa Lou had a pharmacy. He was a pharmacist. He had a pharmacy, and uh, he and his wife Adele had two kids, Blanche and my father David, the baby, and uh, my dad had a. Uh, used to summer um, in Atlantic City, and he used to spend a lot of time working in the pharmacy with his parents. And and the pharmacy at that time was where? Was it in Philadelphia? It was in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Okay. And then, but your dad, later on, we'll get to it, becomes a salesman. When, yes. When he, now, so now let's talk about Cleveland. Okay. Shaker Heights, Shaker Ohio. Shaker Heights, Ohio. So my mom's family was from Poland, both sets of her grandparents, and her parents settled in Cleveland and ended up in Shaker Heights, and my grandpa Sam was a taxi driver, and my grandma Anne was uh, a receptionist, I think, in a doctor's office. So how did your dad... So they were not on the wealthy side no. of Shaker okay. Heights. So how did your dad, who went to pharmacy school... Yes, Temple University. Uh, okay, he's at Temple, finishes Temple University, and then... He gets involved with Breck Shampoo? Yes, so my dad was a traveling salesman for Breck Shampoo. He held he the was, bottle correctly? He did. I think of him often when I'm selling now. I think uh, you know, my dad will always say that I should credit him for my success in business, so I will. He's a great salesman, and I think I get a lot of so, my so, sales ability so, so, from him. So, so dad's on the road in, 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 in Ohio? Dad was on the road. Part of his territory was Ohio, and he was set up on a blind date with my mother while he was uh, going through Columbus, and she was uh, at University of Ohio. It was Ohio, Ohio, Ohio State, State. Sorry, on, Ohio, Ohio State. State. You Buckeyes, sorry. mom. Yeah, I know in Columbus. So he was going through Columbus, and he met my mom, uh, who was a DFIE, and um, that was it. Now, how did your parents end up in Connecticut? Now, by that point, my father's father had. Uh, pharmacy in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, Pigeons Pharmacy. And he asked my dad to come and help him. He needed my father's help with the pharmacy. So my father left the job that he loved, 
which was selling Breck shampoo and but traveling he, around. Right, as a salesman, which later on changes because we're going to get to the story of your dad later on. So now your mother and father relocate to Windsor Locks, Connecticut, Connecticut which is not far from Hartford. Not right? far. And tell me about... You, it's you and your... Uh, My little sister little Dawn, sister. who's 18 months younger than I am. Right, so you're born, okay? In born. Windsor, now in you're Windsor living... Locks, and my dad is a pharmacist, and we thought he was just the king of the world because his pharmacy had a luncheonette counter. Right, and the Carvel machine? He had, a, uh, he had an ice, a soft ice cream machine. So we could get all see, the... So we were very pudgy see, little what, girls. See, see that's what <laughs> pharmacies, you know, when they had soda, you know, they had tap, you know, where you can get an egg cream and, you, you know, other Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Okay, it's not going to Dwayne Reed over here. Now we sell food in yeah. Dwayne Reed. So there was the pharmacy. And yeah. did, you, did you help out in the pharmacy? I was too little, and we ended up moving to... You're too to, short? You couldn't go... Uh, yeah. I spent a lot of time there. I can still remember how it smelled. Um, and I remember, you but, know, pharmacists... What about the makeup? I mean, the customer. I was little. Oh. I, was, I was much more interested in the ice cream machine and the candy. Yes. I didn't really, you know... Right. I didn't have a large makeup area that I remember. It had one of those displays that the Timex watches would spin we, around. Because right. I was, you know, really engaged with that. Um, but uh, by the time I was in elementary school, that pharmacy, which my dad had changed the name of it to Dave's Pharmacy, really wasn't doing well. And... Uh, so he ended up selling it and working as a pharmacist almost around the clock. He had an overnight shift at Arnold Drug in Hartford behind um, you know, bulletproof glass. And it was a really stressful time in our family. My mom was a, a teacher at community college. She has a PhD Now, your in mother, education. you told me, very interesting. She had, so she finishes Ohio State. Where did she get her master's? UConn, and then her PhD at UConn while she was raising two kids and, and while she, she was, was teaching. And her, and her PhD is in what? Education. In education, and she's teaching over there. Yeah. So now, so the, she has two daughters at home, and what happens? This was the black and white Superman? Well, what happened with well, Lois Lane? I mean, I used to watch this, a lot it had of such, such an impression on you. It did, that show in particular. At when the I was Daily little, Planet, right? The Daily Planet. The Daily was, Planet. You know, this is as good as it got. I would watch these reruns of Superman on black and white on TV. I think they were on, on Sundays uh, before the Mutual of Omaha, you know, World of Nature show. And Lion Kingdom. To be yeah, is that what it was? Oh, I used to love both of those, but for me, the one that stuck was the idea of Lois Lane. I think she is um, really underappreciated as a feminist icon. She was beautiful, brilliant, smarter than all the guys. Superman and a good writer. Was a great writer. Superman was crazy about her. She had this fabulous apartment with a terrace in New York City. She worked at the Daily Planet. Mm. She was always getting into adventures. So, so what happens when, speaking of adventures, tell me about you growing up in high school and public school. I, I, I think I had a pretty normal upbringing. I'd love to say there was a lot of adventure. I mean, uh, I worked at the school newspaper. I played the violin. I had a lot of great girlfriends with whom I'm still friends. Now, but what happens is you graduate high school, and, and you, as opposed to certain people applying to a variety of places, you had this in your mind that you were only going to go to one school. Yes. What, if, what if Syracuse didn't accept you? I, I didn't have a plan B. That's often been um, the way my personality works. I really wanted to go to Syracuse. I really wanted to go to the Newhouse School of Public Communications, and I wanted to study newspaper journalism. You could be that specific, newspaper versus magazine. Why do you want to be? Because of Lois. Because of Lois Lane. And so, I wanted to work at the Daily Planet. That was really it. I wanted to come which, to New York and work at the Daily Planet, and I wanted to have great clothes and an apartment with a terrace, and I wanted Superman yeah, so to fall in love with me. What happens is you go to Syracuse, yeah. and you're up there, and, you, and you're working on the newspaper, mm -hmm. and then one summer, what happens? You, you learn, I mean, you're a kid from Connecticut. I mean, you went to Syracuse. How do you ever find out what East Hampton was and, and South Hampton and Montauk? I had no idea what it was, and I was offered a job. They used to recruit from the Hamptons Magazine at the Syracuse, um, at, at the Newhouse School. And this is 25 this is close to 30 yeah, years ago. this was in 84, 85, so... Um, really, at the time, I guess the Hamptons were glamorous, but not the way they are now. But you wanted to do rock and roll, you said. You I wanted to write about entertainment. I loved music, and I loved the idea of kind of music journalism. Um, and I, I wrote about features 
topics when I was uh, one of the editors of the Daily Orange, which was our daily newspaper at Syracuse, which had a huge daily circulation, like 40,000. It was a, an amazing experience to work on it. So I went to the Hamptons, and I spent a lot of time interviewing um, f famous architects, actors, musicians, writers, journalists for the magazine. At the time, it was primarily profiles of famous people who lived around there. Uh, Anne Ryan King, uh, John Irving, um, you know, and Ben Bradley, people who were famous. So you, so. Were, you were profiling these one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, and so, I, so. I was making, making and living on $200 a week in the Hamptons. I remember, well, maybe it was $140 a week. I just you remember. You were overpaid, no order. Yes, oh, right. no question. But I, I learned, I wrote so many articles and I met so many people. So graduation day happens at Syracuse. So tell me what happens then. I mean, now, now, well, you have to, now you have to really get a real job. I had to get a real job. And I was, uh, I didn't get an automatic internship at one of the big newspapers. Even at that time, it was incredibly competitive and the newspapers were struggling somewhat. So I knew I wanted to live in New York and I kept checking the help wanted pages of the New York Times and I saw an ad they were looking for an editor of Real Estate Weekly, and I applied what, for it. But what was Real Estate Weekly? I real had Estate no Weekly. Idea what real, real Estate, estate Weekly. You didn't was. even know what Real Estate was. I, didn't. I mean, you didn't know anything about Real Estate. And Real Estate Weekly, when you joined Real Estate Weekly, was really wherever they could get press releases, and they threw them in together, right? That's right. It, it was, was about. It, doing it was a love stuff. of Hagedorn. Yes, Al Hagedorn loved the real estate community. He loved to go to the luncheons and take pictures of his friends and publish those pictures. And by the way, the real estate community loved Al Hagedorn. He was beloved. He was a sweetheart. Hagedorn Communications uh, got really famous. It was the strike. They published the newspaper during the big newspaper strike. And they also publish uh, Town and Village, and they publish um, the Bronx I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. I want to say the Bronx News. They published. They published a bunch of different community so, newspapers. So, so what is so the, this? Was so, their little so what funny is the niche. job? This was this little newspaper. The job was the editor did everything. Which but you were a kid. How could you become the editor? I, I had mean, been the editor of a forty thousand person a day Daily Orange, right, so I could but, handle a fourteen thousand a week right, newspaper. Right. So, so you get over there, but you yes. know nothing about real. Estate. I didn't know anything about. I didn't know anything about anything. But I got over there, and what I learned was the newspaper could be put together by, all I had to do was write the headline to go with the press release. Then I'd have to lay it out. I would run the copy through the waxing machine, lay it on the pages, and cut it. And at the end of the day, I'd have all these little strips of wax paper that would say, like, continued from page nine all over me because I had to paste it up. Um, and it, originally, it wasn't that challenging. So I made a deal with Mr. Hagedorn that once a week, I could write at least one article if I also just put the paper together the right now, way. Now, your specialty from the Hampton Magazine was writing profiles of people. That's right. So what happens? So what happens is I decide I will write the profile of the week. So tell me about the profile of Bernie, the legendary Bernie Mendick. It was. It was very scary for me. He was one of the very first people. I talked to the PR people at the Real Estate Board of New York, and they set me up with Bernie Mendick. I knew he was a big deal. Um, actually, I met so many greats in the industry because but of the this. Bernie but for Mendick, Bernie Mendick, a great story. All right, so I went. Um, I was going to interview Bernie Mendick and have breakfast with him at Peacock Alley in the Waldorf Astoria. So I show up. And I have like my plastic shoes and I have maybe a nickel in my purse, but my reporter's notebook and my pen and I'm ready to go. And I order orange juice and I'm waiting for Bernie Mendick. And he's late and he's really late. And you know, this was before cell phones. I, I didn't know how to check and see what was going on. And I'm just waiting because I can't figure out how I get out without having the money to pay for the orange juice that I'd ordered, which is the most expensive glass of orange juice I'd ever seen. Eventually, about 45 minutes, um, while I'm sitting there terrified, the waiter or maitre d' comes over and said that Mr. Mendick had called. He had injured himself in his home and was in the hospital. He had a broken arm, and he was terribly sorry. I should order whatever I want for breakfast, <laughs> and I don't have to worry about it. Now, did you? Yes, I had breakfast. <laughs> You felt Thank you, I, Bernie. And then uh, I ended up meeting him in his office and writing a profile about him. But it just was—it was just a funny thing. You also mentioned to me that you met a number 
I met Aaron Gorel. You met a number of very, and Marty Rains, a lot of the legendary people from the real estate industry. I did, Harry Helmsley. Um, gosh, so many different people. I'm trying to, everyone, because it was the industry's paper, people were very comfortable talking to me and giving me access and telling me about their lives and about their business. I got to meet Lou Rudin. I, got, I mean, just the real, the real greats. Of so the how industry. long do you stay there? I, I was there for, I, I want to say three years. And then what, why, why did you move on? I was offered to be the uh, national editor of Commercial Property News. So national? I, yes, and I thought that I would travel and it would be really glamorous. You didn't Only realize that, that first the travel trip was glamorous. Where was the first trip? Oh, a Arizona. It was in Phoenix. I was going to cover a conference in Phoenix. It was very exciting. But this was uh, Milton Gralia, you know. Yep, the Gralia uh, publication. Publications. Era. Milton was a great, the legendary person in the publishing business. And what's your role over there? So I was a national editor at a place where he, they believed if you could write about real estate, you could write about kitchens, you could write about jewelry, you could write about fire chiefs. They had about 45 different publications, each of them very specific to a trade and an industry. And he had great ideas about how to cover conferences, how to cover an industry, how to tell a story. I learned a lot, but it still wasn't the Daily but Planet. Lois Lane is still not at the Planet. So how, how do you get to, how do you get to uh, the Daily News? A, a great reporter who was covering real estate named Neil Barsky was at the Daily News, and he left to take a job at the Wall Street Journal, and that left the desk open. At the time when I applied for the job and was originally turned down, um, so you were turned. I was down. turned down. They had 22 people working in the business section. I think now they're down to about three, um, but at the time it was very beat driven, and you could really cover your beat well. They turned me down because I had no daily newspaper experience and coming from Real Estate Weekly and Commercial Property News really didn't have the right credibility even though I had gone to the Newhouse School. So I pushed back a little bit and I wrote a letter to the then business editor Ann Pod, who's now a very big editor at the Wall Street Journal and I listed 14, I still have that letter, 14 story ideas about the commercial real estate industry in New York City that no one had covered that I could come in and write if she'd just give me a chance. And that letter with an interview got me the job. I did write those stories. So, so how old are you when you go to the Daily News? Or we should say the Daily Planet. The Daily Planet. I know, walking in that first day, in right. the, I mean, the lobby of the Daily News. The lobby of the Daily News, news building, building with a globe. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you probably felt that. Did you wear a gray outfit at that point? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> did so I you could be like Lois Lane, right? So you, God, no. So, no, so how was it the feeling walking, walking, uh, walking upstairs in the, in the Daily News? It was hugely exciting, terrifying and hugely exciting. And so I worked with great reporters. tell me about your days reporters. at the, uh, what you do at the Daily News. I really covered the real estate beat. I got to break news. I did, I did um, find um, my big front page story. I found Marla Maples' Secret Hamptons hideaway. Uh, I was there for the whole Marla Maples, Donald Trump so you era. So you broke the news? Oh. I, no, I, I, I helped hunt her down. So that was about it. But mostly I covered the goings on of the commercial real estate industry, who, what companies were moving there. It was also the time when New York was very concerned about companies leaving Manhattan and going to New Jersey. So it was when Mayor Koch was the mayor. I covered economic development and there was a full page ad he took out kind of with him boarding up the Holland Tunnel, you know, saying, don't leave New York. And it was, uh, was a time when a lot of Japanese were buying office buildings. There were a lot of different things that I was watching very closely. Now, you spent how long at the Daily News? A couple of years. And what happens? Is it a strike? Well, they took a strike vote, and I was really young. And I didn't want to go on strike, but I didn't want to not go on strike. I didn't want to be a scab. So I had interviewed a guy named Ed Gordon, who was uh, the founder and creator of the Edward S. Gordon Company, uh, for a story. And after the story came out, he called me and he said that he thought I had Seichel. And this was right around the time that we took the strike vote. And now, under, uh, it was to Markin, but you were Donovan for a couple of months, Yes, right? my byline changed from Roxanne to Markin to Roxanne Donovan. Which was better for the Daily News. It, it, they, it was yeah, they liked, the they, they liked that at the Daily News. They liked that at the Daily News. They liked the Irish at the Daily News at the time. So, so yeah. what happens is, Eddie Gordon, truly a character, a very brilliant guy who built a legendary business, you know, besides being in the commercial real estate business, he owned real estate, he yeah. owned garages, he owned everything. He meets this 
uh, Lois Lane, okay? And, yes. And what happens? I knew a lot about his business, and I understood what he was talking about. And he, he said, I had Seichel. He said, I had a real spark. And he called me and said, what would it take to get you to come work here? So I threw out the biggest number I had ever heard of. Like, I couldn't even imagine it. So it was impossible. What was it? So what, was it double your salary, triple? It was more than double my salary. So, um, and he said, when can you start? And I said, I can start in two weeks. But you said to me he brokered you. Well, when I got to the office to start, my start date coincided with the date that the New York Daily News went on strike, which I think really broke the heart of the paper in some ways, and it's never been the same since. But I remember m I went to work with people, and all my peers so, so were not going to work. Now you're a kid working in, let us say, a very strange environment. Eddie was there, but they had, he had a lot of vice chairmen, a lot of brilliant people, but as one would say, each one was on the different side of the institution, and I won't say what type of institution, but each one had a room. I mean, right. you work with the legendary Marty Turchin. Yes. And, and Stevie guy came there later on, right, Steve Yeah, Siegel Steve Siegel, there. yeah, that was and, a big And Powers were us. there. John, John Powers, Powers, absolutely. Was there. And, and so, but, I mean, you're a reporter. You're not in the right. PR business. Right. And Eddie Gordon is looking for somebody, and he built a name. People knew Eddie Gordon. Yeah. So tell me about what you were doing there. I was there to protect and promote the brand, and it went much further than the, than the media relations aspect of it. It went to every single ad, what it would look like, what our market reports would look like, what the company brochure would look like. At the time, he did a beautiful annual report that was rich with artwork and, and gorgeous writing. And Ed was a genius when it came to branding. He was a genius in a lot of ways. He's a real character. But um, there were ESG, things. ESG, Edward S. Gordon. Yeah. He was, he, he's a hero of mine. I keep his, I, I keep a framed portrait of him over my desk. I credit him with my, um, with a lot of the inspiration for my starting a business. So, um, so what I learned while I was there was that I was great at working with reporters because I had been a reporter. I really so knew what reporters them. wanted. I understood their deadlines. You I knew how to feed them. I knew, I also knew if I worked in the service of the journalist, it would serve my client. And so a lot of it was about educating the people that I worked with about how we might share our information more openly. And I think that we became a dominant brand, certainly in the media when I was there. We elevated our recognition and credibility through the media while I was there. But I also learned that I was really lousy at creating ads, I was lousy at developing brochures. I'm not great on the overall building campaigns. Um, so how does the 29-year-old kid who's, who really brokered Eddie Gordon, I mean a broker to broker a broker over there to get a good salary and, you, and he finally paid you the money. Yes. How do you decide at 29 years of age, single, okay, at this time, mm -hmm. okay, uh, how do you decide to create a in the PR business, what was the, the, the buzz? What was the, 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 the light that caused you to create grading communications? Well, there were a few things. First of all, I wasn't the only one that noticed what I wasn't good at. So there were people in the company who probably thought, oh my gosh, she's great at this, but how are we gonna fill this void? So I realized I was good at media relations. And at the time I was dating a guy named Tom Scarangello, who I since married. Um, and he told me that I could really do this. I could start a business. And when I went to talk to Ed Gordon about it, he said, absolutely, sign me up. I'll be your first client. And, and, he's the, and CBR, ESG became, became later. right. So, so tell me about the, the growing into this business. I mean, a small, I mean, where was your office? Well, I started in HQ's office facility. I worked on a trade with, um, the, um, the folks at um, HQ. You gave so, them PR and they gave you an office and They gave space. me an office. So how, how did you grow to become, as I would say, the, the female Howard Rubenstein, which is a great compliment, okay? It's a okay? huge compliment. Okay? It's you know, incredibly that, that, flattering right, to be very, compared but you, at all but you, to And you have stayed specifically in the real estate market. Yeah. You, you've kept yourself to your initial roots. I love real estate. I discovered that at Real Estate Weekly. When you talk about real estate, it touches people's lives. It is, there's passion, there's greed, there's fighting, there's design, there's beauty, and there's change. But and you I see, love it. What people, so, what people don't realize that PR is also crisis management. 
Yes, right? sometimes. Okay, it's yes. crisis management, it's branding, yes. it's everything, and that's what part of what you do over there. And I mean, how many? You, I mean, you represent the who's who in the commercial real estate business. I do. I have great clients. In addition to CBRE, I get to work with Mac Real Estate Group. I get to work with Halstead. RFR. I get to work you with know. RFR. Yeah. I mean, I get to work with Thornton Tomasetti and Siska Hennessy. I've I have wonderful, wonderful clients. I'm very lucky. So, you know, let, let's talk a little bit besides that. You know, you, you've given back to the community. Let's talk about Joan's legacy. Okay. I'm fortunate to be um, on the board of Joan's Legacy, which is Uniting Against Lung Cancer. So how do, how do you get involved with Joan's Legacy? Well, that's the unfortunate part. I lost my sister-in-law, Joan, who I adored to lung cancer in 2001. Right, she and she never smoked. Was... Never smoked, and it's much more common than people think. And we had, there was no treatment options for Joan you know, 12 years ago. So we wanted to do something. We wanted to force, find a way to force the best and brightest in the country to look at lung cancer in the labs and come up with better solutions and new treatments. So by the creation of Uniting Against Lung Cancer, which started as Joan's Legacy, we've been able to fund $10 million worth of research grants. And I consider us the venture capital of lung cancer research. So we give seed money so that the best and brightest will look at projects and then they'll be able to get follow-on funding. So at about $9 million of funding, we have over $55 million in follow-on funding that's come to us. And we've been very involved in developing these targeted therapies that are literally saving people's lives. Our money has been put to great work, and it's making a difference. I just wish we had more of it to play with. So let's talk about your husband and your children. Tell me about okay. that. So I'm married to Tom Scarangello, who's CEO of Thornton Tomasetti Engineers. He's the engineer of record on Yankee Stadium and uh, Barclays Center and a number of other structures. He's just a great guy. We have a terrific time together. And tell me about the... Uh, the boys. The boys. I have two sons. Names. Elliot, Elliot, who's 16, and Anthony, who's 14. And they go to Loyola High School now. We love Loyola. They're really happy. And tell me about Dad. Dad went into the guitar business? Yes, yeah. my dad got, got to be a traveling salesman again, and he created a fantastic company, the Tamarkin Company. Sorry, Carrie Tamarkin. There was one before right. you. Um, and he sold musical instruments, and uh, he's retired right, now. Right, and, and you used to help him, right, make these? Yes, we used to help him. He invented something called the music card clip, which helped musicians carry their music around, and uh, we used to manufacture them in our basement. And, and, and my mother, right now, is a boxing judge in the state of Florida. She right, she's one of the few boxing and female boxing judges, right? She is. She was the first female boxing judge licensed in the state of Florida. She's really active with that. So, you know, it, so it's really interesting that, you know, it, it, there are very few people who really get that opportunity from what they were a child that they really wanted to become, yeah. be Lois Lane. Yeah. And you've become more than Lois Lane. <laughs> you've become Roxanne Donovan, who's been a, a true legend in the PR business in New York, and I'm so happy you were here today. Thanks, be Michael. On my show. Thank you.